Thanks, everyone. Uh, we're going to start our Salty Sessions series. It's the f- first day of a four-day uh, series. Every Wednesday until the Wednesday before Earth Day, we're going to be having a series of talks about coastal health management. As a surfer, really important to me. Um, I'm pretty sure it's important to all of us. We're going to be kicking this off tonight with Dash from Ventura Land Trust. Um, so let's hear it for Dash. And with that, we'll have Dash take it away. All right. Well, <laughs> thanks everyone for coming. Hopefully, those of you sitting right here realize what you're getting into. Uh, Yeah, tonight's lecture is going to be about the interface between what happens on land and the work specifically of our group, the Ventura Land Trust, and how it relates to ocean health. But also more broadly, just the activities that we can do here on land that impact the ocean. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's going to be a little bit free form, uh, not super rehearsed, so sorry about that, Uh, but... Yeah, there'll be a little bit of time for questions at the end if anyone has any questions. And hopefully it's interesting. So real quick, for those of you who don't know, who is the Ventura Land Trust? Who are we? Um, We used to be called Ventura Hillsides Conservancy for the first 14 years of our existence. Some of you might remember that. That's why tonight's feature beer is the Hillside Hop. It's kind of a recognition of our history. And last year, we changed our name to Ventura Land Trust to better reflect the work we do, because it's not just the hillsides, but it's also our rivers, it's also hiking trails, it's also oak groves and the canyons and the arroyos and everything that makes the Ventura region so beautiful. So um, there's five of us full-time staff. I've got two colleagues over here, Adrian and Kate. (laughs) And uh, I see a lot of members and supporters in the crowd as well. And so our mission right here succinctly is we want to permanently protect the land, water, wildlife, and scenic beauty of the Ventura region for current and future generations. I think it's a pretty noble goal. Uh, Hopefully we got a lot of people here who agree with that vision. And before I jump into the ocean stuff, the marine science stuff, real quick, land trusts are not government agencies. We don't get direct funding from the government. You know, your tax dollars don't go to land trusts except when we win a grant from the government. We're a nonprofit, run-of-the-mill nonprofit like other groups in town, um, like the Botanic Garden or uh, like the Humane Society, other groups that rely on members and individuals who donate money and time to make the organization work. And so um, a land trust basically uh, exists to manage land, to protect land, and uh, in certain situations it can be agricultural or it can be historic sites or it can be trails, but anything on land. So what I'm gonna cover tonight Um, are some of the threats to ocean health and how what we do on land can, you know, mitigate those those threats, mitigate those issues. So a few of them, overfishing, water pollution, marine plastics, and the big one, climate change, which has many um, issues with it that are threats to our ocean. And specifically, climate change, marine plastics, and water pollution are things that we can have a big impact on, on land here with our, with our work here and what, the things that we do on land. And then since, uh, like John said, he's a surfer, I love to surf. Uh, I also want to talk a little about coastal recreation, mostly so I could show some photos of myself surfing and uh, talk about the issues that are really important to me. So... Some of the same issues 
that I mentioned that previous slide are also uh, threats to coastal recreation, to the things that we love to do. If you love to surf, water pollution is a big issue for you. Just like uh, climate change with sea level rise or uh, global weirding, I'll get into that in a little bit, but those of you who surf may have recognized this was the worst winter in you know, memory for most people. And part of that has to do with climate change. And then public access limitation, coastal development, those are also threats to our ability to have fun in the ocean. So first one, here's a screenshot from last week from the Surfer's Point camera. You can see the brown water right next to the coast, some less brown water and then blue water offshore. Uh, water pollution is a huge issue in California and 80% uh, of water pollution comes from land-based sources. So that includes urban runoff, you know, everything that people throw on the street, someone throws their cigarette butt, if someone leaves their dog waste on the street, that washes down. Uh, that's also agricultural runoff. That's also if you fertilize your lawn or if you use rat poison, those things can wash off as well. And then industrial discharge, sewage, and chemicals um, from industrial sources. So this is a really interesting photo. I wish I had a higher res version. This is the El Nino 2005 floods. And you can see that the water pollution coming out from Ventura's rivers, from the Santa Clara and Ventura River, actually made it all the way out to the islands, impacted the water quality all the way 20 miles offshore. Um, and so this just shows the impact of, of coastal water pollution. I mean, it, it can go really far out to sea and have long-lasting impacts. So how does the land trust come in? Well, one of the key ways that you can prevent water pollution or that you can uh, mitigate against water pollution is through wetlands. So how many people know what wetland that photo is right there? Can anyone recognize that area? That's actually right by Surfer's Point, the Ventura River mouth, just looks really different from the air. And um, that's the last line of defense for water reaching the ocean. That's right before the river breaches into Surfer's Point, where so many people surf uh, and go to the beach and swim. And so, the land trust, Ventura Land Trust, actually works to manage the Ventura River estuary. And we own property there and we protect it because one of the um, most important things about wetlands is they clean the water. They're the kidneys of the water system. They create wildlife habitat. Uh, they filter the water before it reaches the ocean. So protecting wetlands is one of the most important things we can do to stop land-based pollution from reaching the ocean. It's, it's the last line of defense for us. And it's really important for groups like ours to protect, the, protect wetlands. It's really high on our priority list. So another way that wetlands help pre uh, prevent water pollution is this graph shows basically runoff in a river from different land uses. So the highest and most runoff is from urban, urban land use. When we have hard spaces all around, if you guys saw during that last big rainstorm, if you went outside, you saw the water rushing down the street into the storm drains because there's nowhere else for it to go. Whereas if you have agricultural land, right, you have crops, you have trees that intercept the water, you have soil that absorbs the water, and so there's less runoff and it comes slower. Uh, if you have forest land, even slower, and then, um, or agricultural forests, so like working forest lands, and then forested lands are the best. And here's another example of that. If you have trees and grass, you have 80 to 100% of the rain makes it into the soil, into the groundwater. Whereas on a, urban area, 90 to 100 percent is running off directly into the ocean. So everything that we can do to protect natural landscapes means less runoff, less pollution, less surfers getting sick, less animals 
getting sick. And here's a map of Ventura County. This is actually areas where rainwater will make it into groundwater. So those of you here, probably a fair few of you live in Ventura and may know we're in stage four drought right now, I believe. Um, our groundwater basins are completely overdrawn, totally stressed. So protecting these areas where the rain can actually make it into the groundwater is really important. But that also prevents runoff. So not only is that beneficial for humans in that will have more water in the ground to use, but it means that that water is not running off and going into the ocean and bringing pollution with it. So if we can protect these areas, it's only certain areas that will actually um, allow groundwater or allow rainwater to sink into the groundwater. So if we can identify those areas and as a land trust strategically protect them, then we can have a, a big impact on not only our water sources, but uh, water quality in the ocean. All right, so here's one that's been in the news a fair bit recently. Some of you might have seen this. Uh, there's this idea of a trash island in the Pacific. Uh, <laughs> yeah, multiple islands. It's actually more of like a trash smog in the ocean where as you get closer to the center, there's more or, or you know, a greater accumulation of trash, but it's not quite like a mountain or an island. It's more just an area full of trash in the middle of the ocean. And it's actually three times larger than they thought previously and increasing exponentially. So this is, this is a huge issue, a huge problem. Um, in 20 years, it's estimated there'll be more plastic mass in the ocean than animal mass. So there'll be a greater amount of plastic than living things in the ocean. And you know, this has a lot of serious effects, some of them known and some of them unknown. So entanglement is a big, big issue. You see this turtle here got entangled in like a milk, uh, you know, one of those little things that stays on the milk carton after you open the lid. And uh, you can see what happened to him. And then the picture on the right is a shorebird whose parents were foraging for it and what they saw floating on the ocean happened to be plastic. So they bring it back to the baby bird and feed him plastic until his belly is full of plastic and it dies. So that's one of the serious impacts of plastic pollution. But then also plastic uh, gets broken down into smaller and smaller pieces and then eaten by tiny animals and moves up the food chain. And we don't really know what the effects are. I mean, we know that certain chemicals used in the plastic making process are actually endocrine disruptors, which means that they, they mess with your hormonal system and are also known cancer-causing chemicals. So having that get into the, into the food web, into the fish that people eat, I mean, we don't really know the effects of that yet, but it's probably not good. And 80, more than 80% of these marine plastics enter the ocean from land. So, what can we do? One of the big ones, right, river and beach cleanups, uh, especially river cleanups if you want to intercept the trash before it enters the ocean. Uh, this is a photo of some of our great volunteers working at Emma Wood State Beach, cleaning up a bunch of trash and preventing it from entering the ocean. And here we have a photo of the Ventura River. Um, this is a property that the, that the land trust was given in 2012, and this was the condition it was in. So some of you might be able to see there's like a beach chair in the river, and that had a hole cut out of it in the bottom. So the people who were using this site were using that chair uh, as their restroom facilities. So, um, yeah, one of the most important things that we do to prevent plastic from entering the ocean is prevent situations like this happening. Since we've owned the property, we've cleaned up something like um, 100 tons of trash just from 
this eight acre parcel, probably a little bit more than 100 tons. And so here we have uh, the estuary, the area where the Ventura River meets the ocean. You can see the fairgrounds, uh, you can see the RV resort, and then Ventura River coming down. And so the Ventura Land Trust actually owns this property right here between the Main Street and the 101 Bridge. And um, you know, one of our main goals when we're managing this property is to prevent trash from entering the ocean and also prevent people from, from camping or you know, illegally occupying the land and, and it getting back to that point how it was before we owned the property. Not only is it a, a pollution, a trash issue, an environmental issue, but it's also a safety issue because the river floods and then first responders have to rescue people who are in the river. So it's a, there's multiple levels of, of public safety issues and environmental safety issues that come with people living down here. And so the city and the county also own property and the state parks system owns property in this Ventura River estuary. And because of the great work that the Ventura Land Trust has done over the past six years or so, we actually now manage the whole area here. And so some of you might have participated with us on cleanups. Um, we're gonna have a bunch of cleanups this summer and a really big one on Coastal Cleanup Day where we're gonna move over just um, to the bottom of this photo in Emma Wood State Beach because there's a big problem with trash over there. So, um, yeah, this is one of the last lines of defense before this trash enters the ocean. We come out there with our volunteers, uh, staff members, clean up the trash and keep it from entering the, entering the ocean. And, you know, part of this is happening, or similar situations are happening all over the state right now. And the reason, the big reason now, because cities have installed catchment devices and have all these ways to prevent trash from entering the ocean, the big source now is actually illegal encampments in our natural areas, in our river bottoms. And so this homelessness crisis, which is a, you know, a terrible thing, it's a, a societal problem, has also led to an environmental crisis. And that's impacting the ocean. You know, having people who don't have homes, who are living without sanitation, who are living without trash service, um, has an impact on our ocean and our, the ocean health. So it's a really interesting issue that we have to deal with. Um, not what you typically think of as an environmental group doing, but it, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's a problem that's only gonna get worse and we're hoping that all the stakeholders who are involved can get together to try and figure out, you know, what can we do to protect our environment um, Without, we don't want to demonize homeless people. Or we don't want them to be scapegoated, but it's a huge issue right now. And um, hopefully there'll be some solutions coming. So now I get to the non-controversial issue, <laughs> climate change. Hopefully most people here have some understanding of it. Um, I'm not gonna go into the how and the why of climate change, but basically there's four main issues um, that impact ocean health. So it's ocean warming and deoxygenation. When you have a warmer ocean, there's less oxygen in the water. When a liquid heats up, like when you're boiling water, you see the oxygen or the air leaving it. That's the air bubbles when you boil water. Um, so that limits the, what fish and what animals can live in certain areas if there's not enough oxygen. Then there's sea level rise. Uh, ocean acidification. When CO2 enters the ocean, it turns into an acid. And so that limits um, what kind of shellfish and other animals can live in the water. And then weather extremes and disruption. Uh, we've seen some of that this year. So how does the land trust fit in? Well, one of the big things we can do is protect carbon sinks. This is a carbon sink is an area where carbon dioxide is taken out of the air and put into the, into the ground.
by different processes, and they call it a sink. There's sources and sinks. And um, wetlands, as it happens, are some of the best carbon sinks on the planet. They sequester more carbon than any other ecosystem type. Also grasslands, he healthy soils, you know, um, farmers who do, who try and um, encourage healthy soils can become carbon sinks as well. And one of the things that we do a lot of, and some people here have participated in, is invasive species removal. To keep our wetlands and our grasslands and our other lands healthy, we remove invasive species like thistle and uh, mustard and broom and Arundo donax, the giant reed. And that's one way to keep these carbon sinks healthy and protected. Um, another way to protect against the impacts of climate change is by making sure our ecosystems are healthy in general. So a healthy ecosystem is more resilient. Resiliency is something we really need in the face of climate change. If you have, you know, your coastal area already stressed by pollution, right, already stressed by sea, by sea level rise, all these, by coastal development, you know, uh, and then you add other impacts, it's not going to be able to handle it. But if we have a handle on the things we, we can deal with, like, you know, we can't solve climate change and, and people emitting carbon, but we can make sure that our ecosystems, our rivers, our coastal areas are healthy um, by stopping pollution, by these other things I was mentioning, that makes it more resilient to climate change. And, oh, and this is, um, this is actually another of the Ventura Land Trust properties. This is the Ventura River as well, just south of Foster Park. This is our Big Rock property. It actually has water year round. It's a really beautiful uh, property here and um, really important for wildlife. And I'm happy to say it actually fared really well in the Thomas Fire. Um, we had almost no impact to the stream area and the river area, so that was really great. And then <laughs> this is a little bit more esoteric way to mitigate against climate change. But um, yeah, keep it local. If we have local areas where people can mountain bike and hike and recreate, have fun outside, they don't have to drive to Ojai or Santa Barbara or the Santa Monica Mountains to do the things that they love. So if we can, you know, one of the ways that Ventura Land Trust sees itself as, as providing a service for the community is we really want to advocate for more public access, more public trails, more ability for the people of Ventura to get outside and enjoy nature. And um, yeah, by doing that, right, you have less carbon emissions. Um, <laughs> so you're kind, of, you're kind of mitigating against climate change. Um, but, you know, that really is something important to us as an organization. And so one of the projects we're working on is we're trying to purchase what would be the first publicly accessible nature preserve in Ventura with uh, already has 10 miles of hiking and biking trails, has over 2,000 acres of open space, beautiful oak groves that survived the Thomas Fire, and um, would really be a game changer for this community. So that's something that we really feel strongly about, and you know, in, in its own way, does, does help against climate change. Then there's this third impact, the sea level rise. Um, some of you here, if you've been in Ventura a long time, have probably seen this happen over time, where you have a structure, infrastructure near the beach, eventually the beach erodes, uh, so you build a seawall to protect that structure, and then eventually you don't have a beach anymore. Uh, this happened along the promenade right here at, at Sea Street, and um, has happened up and down the coast. So this is, not only does this uh, eliminate shoreline habitat that like birds and crabs and all these other animals need, uh, but it also has big impacts on us who want to use a beach, who want to go to the beach, right? Or who want to surf, who want to just be able to enjoy this beautiful area. So this is a, this is a serious issue. And so it just so happens that right here in Ventura, we have one of the premier sites for sea level rise adaptation. 
So how many people here know, have seen the, the new sand dunes in the last like five years out uh, by the fairgrounds? Some of you have probably, probably seen that, right? Server's point. So there was the old bike path went by the fairgrounds right next to the beach. And it was actually eroding into the water. And the city wanted to put a seawall there to protect the bike path and the parking lot. And Surfrider Foundation, uh, with support from the land trust, actually came up with a better strategy, which is to rebuild the sand dunes, move the infrastructure back, right? We don't want to, are we going to trade the beach for a parking lot? That doesn't seem like a good trade. So the idea is you move the infrastructure back, you rebuild the dunes, and those of you who go to the beach pretty often, you know that the beach like comes and goes over the year, right? Like after a big winter storm, a bunch of sand gets ripped off the beach. Then when the waves are small again for a while, the sand builds up. And so if we have that room and we have those sand dunes, the, the ocean can move, the beach sand can move back and forth, and we actually can mitigate against sea level rise. And we can adapt to this new higher sea levels. All right, now we get <laughs> to the whole reason I agreed to do this talk in the first place. <laughs> I wanted to show a few surf photos. I wanted to talk about, um, yeah, <laughs> My wife told me recreation is not a good word to use. So the only thing I could come up with was fun. So threats to coastal fun, not, not coastal recreation. Um, and so I talked about global weirding, which is uh, kind of a funny phrase. But um, yeah, some of you, how many people here are into surfing or maybe pay attention to the waves? We've got a couple here. Well, um, if you know any surfers, You've probably noticed that they're like extra depressed this year. It, um, maybe salty sessions was a good name. <laughs> they're probably like extra salty uh, because there was like no surf. Besides a couple storms in October, we basically didn't have any of our typical wintertime swells. And the reason, it, I mean, you can't pin any one thing on directly only on climate change. But the jet stream has been going super weird and it's global weirding. I mean, traditionally, the jet stream goes from Japan towards the west coast of the US. It's kind of a little bit curvy, but the past few years and during, over our, our huge drought we had for six years, the jet stream was going like north-south, like crazy. And I mean, even this year, the North Pole was 40 degrees Fahrenheit, when there's no sun, when it should be like negative 20. Um, so what that was is warm air from down by Hawaii was going straight north to the North Pole. And then cold air from the North Pole was going straight down the East Coast. And they've been getting like crazy snowstorms and they've been getting all the surf. So um, yeah, so this global weirding, it, I mean, Obviously, it has way greater impacts than just on my ability to surf, but it's definitely a threat. I mean, I don't know. Am I going to have to move to the East Coast to get surf now? It's like terrible, but um, here's another representation of what's... Basically, this has, been, this has been what's happening the last like eight years, more or less, has been our wintertime situation where the jet stream goes north, Alaska's warm, we're hot and in drought, and then, you know, the Midwest is like under 10 feet of snow and, and the East Coast is getting all these Northeasters. And um, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty crazy pattern. Uh, and, and, you know, Europe is having like the storm of the century like four times a year <laughs> over there. They've been getting 100 foot waves and stuff. It's, it's crazy. It's global weirding. So more threats to coastal fun. Um, I grew up in Santa Cruz in more Northern California. And when I first came down, uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara and I was kind of amazed by how much of the coastline here is just straightened out and, and has rocks along it. You know, so much of Southern California has basically been, you know, we have a road and, a, and the train tracks and then a bunch of rocks on the beach. And I would talk to people, they didn't even realize that those rocks aren't natural that that's like not how the shoreline should look. Those are brought in to protect the road. And 
what that does is that squeezes the beach. You know, over time, that doesn't leave much room for that yearly variation of the sand moving back and forth. Um, those of you who've ever tried to surf at a high tide, like maybe down here at Sea Street, there's crazy backwash comes off the rocks. Um, and so that's definitely a threat. And with sea level rising, right now, you know, we're locked in for two feet of sea level rise. Could be six feet if we don't do anything about it. Like, that's going to be the new normal. So imagine the highest tide of the year right now being a low tide. That's what we're looking at in the future. So, um, and then, and with, you know, seawalls and coastal armoring like this, it doesn't leave many options. Here we have uh, right along the promenade. They put in an emergency, emergency seawall last year, I believe. Um, they claimed it's an emergency, even though you could have seen it coming for 30 years. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden an emergency, uh, even though it's been eroding for as long as anyone can remember. But, um, you know, I understand the promenade. It's something important to the city. You got to protect it. But we also need to have a conversation about what are we going to protect? What is worth it? When do we want to sacrifice the beach to save what's on land? And when do we want to move back um, and have the beach? And I think, honestly, in the future, those communities that have beaches in Southern California, that's going to be a huge economic draw because there's not going to be many places that do. So it's something that Ventura really needs to think about. Um, you know, if you're going looking to buy a house and you've got a $5 million to spend, you come at low tide, it looks great. You're like... I'm investing, what could go wrong, right? Like, this looks amazing. But, um, yeah. You know, already in Miami, there's a real estate bubble that's bursting where homes that are below a certain elevation are losing their value because they flood, ev like, every year. And, you know, that's eventually going to happen around here as well. Um, so... Yeah, it's, I mean, some of these are gonna be a losing battle. And so, in some places, like in Louisiana, where they're, the coastline is eroding and the sea level's rising, land trusts play a role in helping um, either purchase land or purchase houses from people that don't wanna live there anymore and help try and restore that area back to its natural state. I don't know if that's possible in our <laughs> super expensive Southern California real estate market, but it's something, it's an idea. So um, yeah, it's not a sustainable situation right there. So another thing I want to talk about, um, how many people know where this is? Anyone got any ideas? It's not, is that here Oxnard? Yeah, so, um, so that's Port Wainimi, the pier right there, Port Wainimi Pier in the top left. And then um, this is actually Ormond Beach. So this is one of, the, one of the few places in the county that doesn't have any sort of coastal armoring or structures right on the beach, right? There's the one power plant and the Halico site kind of right in the middle there. Um, but basically it's sand dune, coastal wetland, and then farmland. And so the Nature Conservancy, which is a much larger land trust than us, um, they, they, along with the state government, have purchased most of this site here. Um, there's still some farmland uh, that's owned by the farmers, but there's discussions to purchase the whole thing. And then over time, to let that shoreline recede, move back with sea level rise, so that we'll still have beach we'll still have a coastal environment and a, a coastal wetland there. So I think that's gonna be a really, I mean, right now, Ormond Beach is definitely not a tourist draw. But if I was gonna invest my money for like the 30 year, 30 year time frame, that's gonna be like prime beachfront property because no one else is gonna have a beach. Um, and I, I don't wanna be a super downer for this, for this conversation. I mean, uh, you know, this is a good thing. Oxnard is gonna get, more economic revitalization and, and maybe some good surf too. Um, it really is a beautiful place, Ormond Beach. And um, you can see it's one of the few areas where there's like not big infrastructure right close to the beach. Historically, our, our coastal zone is our most expensive real estate. 
It's where we put all giant hotels and, and things like that, right? It makes sense. But with sea level rise, that means there's nowhere, there's nowhere to go. We're not going to like remove the Crown Plaza. Um, that's there. So this provides a really unique opportunity. And Ventura Land Trust has actually been talking with Nature Conservancy and with the state of California about the future management of that Ormond Beach parcel and, and making it a destination for recreation in the county. And, and a showcase for how to, how to deal with sea level rise. Um, all right, and then so switching away real quick, um, one of the things that I just wanted to talk about because it's very topical right now um, was just real quick, Thomas Fire Recovery, um, Ventura Land Trust lands. We had two properties burn. One came through it, or two of them came through it fine. But, um, you know, we've been out surveying properties and also other people's properties in the hillsides. And I'm happy to report that things look really good. We see a lot of regrowth. And um, I just wanted to highlight that we encourage people to not try and seed with non-native grass or to try and, you know, it looks, the hillsides or certain areas will look super burned and super bad, but it recovers really fast. And one of the things you have, um, anyone know what this wildflower is, this little guy? Good, manzanita, that was a good guess. It's a lupin, good call. So these put up big purple flower spikes. Uh, I was at a property recently and half the hill was covered in these lupins. So it's going to be an amazing year when the um, wildflower year, and we're already seeing a ton of stuff recovering. Um, everything regrows. You got the little prickly pear in the bottom corner there, it was totally burned and it's growing up again. Um, and so, yeah, that's happy news. And with the native regrowth, we have the soil stabilization. We have the native plants preventing runoff and preventing more pollution from entering the ocean. Um, you know, if you plant some, you wanna just go out there and cover this, the, the burnt area with something, you pr plant ryegrass seed, non-native seed, it's an annual, grows for six months and then dies, and then you don't have anything holding the soil again. So if you let these long-rooted perennial native plants regrow, you're actually doing a better job of stabilizing the soil, stabilizing the slopes. And, um, yeah, that was about all I had prepared. Uh, didn't want to do too long. This is the first salty session, so we're trying to see how it went. But uh, thanks for paying attention. <laughs> Me and you have a lot to talk about. <laughs> okay, cool. I'll give you my number. You don't take it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thank you. I don't know. We can do some questions and answers. Um, or, or I can just call it and you guys can come up and talk to me after. You can email me dash at venturalandtrust.org if you're interested in continuing the conversation more. Um, yeah, and I just want to oh, give a shout out to Leashless Brewing Co. There, John here. Yep. Just want to jump in real quick. So there's a slide that Dash had about the emergency revetment that went in two winters ago. And there's a group of us that randomly formed, uh, we called ourselves the Surfers Point Coalition, and we've been meeting with the city, Army Corps of Engineers, and California Coast Commission to get the city to get this uh, permit approved and to make the city adopt a local coastal management plan that would include these types of events and how they would address them so that when properly warned, they can't just um, dismiss the warning, if you will, and a plan has to be put in place for them to follow through because as has been pointing out, that revetment has caused probably more damage than good and shortly after it was dropped, it wasn't needed. Um, so anyways, that's that for that. Um, this is the first of four speaker series seminars. Next week, we're gonna be talking about um, adaptive shoreline, the managed retreat, uh, waves as resources. The third week, we're going back to talking about Matillaha Dam, 
the role that taking down the dam is going to have in replenishing our coastal uh, playground and overall sand budget. How much sand do we need? Where does it go? When it goes? So on and so forth. So we do have a lot of cool talks coming on. Dash was just the man to start us off. The guinea pig. Um, yes, the guinea pig. And I just realized a pointer. I should have brought a pointer. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, let's give another round of applause to uh, the Land Trust. If you do want to know more about the Salty Sessions series, it's on our Facebook page on the events. Uh, it's a, the whole uh, abstracts for all the talks and whatnot are, are listed. So with that. All right. Yep. Thanks again, everyone.